Welcome, I'm Olivia White, Executive Director of the Amistad Center for Art and Culture, and we welcome you to our first of four Authors at Amistad uh, events. The Amistad Center, as many of you know, we, we tell the story of Africans in America, and we mostly tell it through visual art, but not only through visual art. So tonight is a wonderful opportunity to hear the story of Africans in America, in, in America, at least one family, through words and narrative. We're very excited to be able to do that tonight. I want to say thank you to Dawn Davis at HarperCollins for supporting this idea from the beginning. And to my friends, some of you may know, uh, Jenny Quigley and Robin Jengris, who started a wonderful book program at, at Renbrook that I was happy to be a part of last year. So I, I hope they're flattered because we sort of kind of copied. But we're, we realize that there is a thirst out there for uh, knowledge and for a good read, and so we're really happy to be able to join in and offer that opportunity. It takes money to do this, and the proceeds from our membership program have supported this event tonight, and I would like to thank all of our members, if you would raise your hands if you're a member, and raise your hand if you're a future member. <laughs> okay, so 100% of those hands need to be up there. So we really do thank our members for supporting us consistently and year over year. Um, for this particular event, we are grateful to have the support of the Connecticut Center for the Book at Com Connecticut Humanities, and I would like Sandy Santi to come up, there you are, you changed seats, and say a few words to greet you. Thank you. I am Sandy Santi. I work at Connecticut Humanities, and the Connecticut Center for the Book is now located at Connecticut Center. Connecticut Humanities. Um, Connecticut Humanities, this is a program, the Center for the Book, that promotes writing and reading and all things books and literary heritage. So Amanda Roy, who is with me, and I are here tonight. This is the first kickoff that we've got for one of these programs that we've supported. And we've done it through a program called Community Reads, like a one book, one region, or a big read, whatever. So this is really exciting. We're very excited to be here. We thank Olivia. We're very excited to hear Rachel Swarm speak, as well as Pamela Trotman Reed. Um, we invite you to steal some bookmarks, lots of them, and also make sure you grab a map which shows where all of our different programs are this year having to do with the Center for the Book and Community Reads. It's a lot to remember, but basically it's 10 locations where we have supported books and reading through one of these kinds of programs, so we're very excited about this. And um, we're looking forward to it. Stay tuned. Stay on our website to hear what's going on. We're looking forward to it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sandy. And I will tell you, Sandy is serious about this program being a reading program, not just a listening program. So how many of you read the book already? Great. Because Sandy can actually tell if you've read the book or not. So no cheating. I would like to welcome the students from University of St. Joseph. Um, would you just stand up and let us know who you are? And the faculty that's with them. Thank you, and I also want to welcome our budding journalists from Manchester Community College, who will all be working for the New York Times one day, which is great. So thank you. It's my pleasure now to introduce our guest speakers. Um, even though they have different professional titles, I really think that our two speakers tonight are educators of the highest order um, in their own ways. Pamela Trotman Reed has served as president of the University of St. Joseph since January 2008. She has skillfully worked to build upon the university's reputation for academic excellence and ensure its commitment to integrity, women's leadership, and service, and has become a respected voice in the greater Hartford region. A developmental psychologist, she's nationally known as a scholar in gender and racial issues and as an active participant in scholarly organizations. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Reed to the stage, who will be our interviewer tonight. Thank you very much. Thanks. Rachel Swarns has been a correspondent for the New York Times since 1995 and has reported on domestic policy and national po politics, immigration, the presidential campaigns of 2004 and 2008, and First Lady Michelle Obama. She has been a foreign correspondent for the Times, reporting from Russia, Cuba, Southern Africa, where she served as the Johannesburg Bureau Chief. She has also worked for the Miami Herald, where she covered the LA riots and the aftermath of Hurricane Andrew. 
and at the St. Petersburg Times. Please welcome Rachel Swans to the stage. And so thank you for being here and take it away. Thank you so much, Olivia. You know, it's very interesting because rather than doing a formal kind of interview, um, I've been so privileged to, to get to know Rachel a little bit all during the day. She came and met with students and faculty at the university. And so, but let me start out. Um, I didn't get to see how many people actually read the book, so I'll, I'll start out with a, a softball question um, to just say, what sort of inspired you to get into the book for the people who have yet to read the opening? Right. Um, as you know, I'm a reporter for the New York Times, and this book emerged out of my time covering Michelle Obama, the First Lady. And as, uh, as you heard, I've done a lot of things at the New York Times, um, but this was something of an unusual assignment. Newspapers like the New York Times don't typically assign one person to cover the First Lady. That's a job that's usually covered by the White House correspondents who travel with the president on Air Force One and pepper him with questions in the briefing room. But there was a sense after that election in 2008 that we should do things a little differently. There was a sense that this family, this first African-American family, living in this house, this white house built in part by slave labor, with slave labor, was going to be written about for generations to come. And we journalists like to think of ourselves as writing the first draft of history. And so my editor said, you know, we should be involved in chronicling this. And so they asked me whether I would write about Michelle Obama, and I said, sure. And in January of that first year, in fact, before, right before Inauguration Day, my colleague, one of my colleagues, was working on an article about the president and his rainbow family. And at the very last minute, we realized we didn't know much about Michelle Obama's ancestry and her family tree. And so this colleague of mine enlisted a genealogist to do some digging. Um, but we didn't give the lady nearly enough time, and so she didn't come up with very much, and so the article ran about the president and his rainbow family. But unbeknownst to us, this genealogist got hooked. And in September of that first year that the Obamas were in the White House, she called us back and said, hey, you know, I found some amazing things. Would you be interested in writing about it? And of course, we were very interested. And so I ended up getting on a plane and heading to Birmingham, Alabama, where I spent hours in the wonderful library there, the archives there, um, in the library in downtown Birmingham, knocking on doors, um, interviewing people in churches, and trying to find anyone who knew anything about a man by the name of Dolphus Shields, who was the First Lady's great, great, grandfather, and he happened to be biracial. And the article that came out a month later in October on the front page of the New York Times was about Dolphus's parents. His mother, Melvinia, who was the great, great, great grandmother of Michelle Obama, and a slave girl valued at $475 in 1852, and the First Lady's great, great, great grandfather who was a white man whose identity was a mystery. And it ran on the front page. There was a lot of hullabaloo. I got to be on TV, which is not something I'm always dying to do. I'm a newspaper reporter for a reason. <laughs> um, and, and then the very next day, um, an editor at HarperCollins sent me an email saying, you know, well, that's amazing, but what about the rest of the story? Would you write a book about the rest of it? And that's how I got started. You know, it's amazing. I said to Rachel, after reading this book, of course, my discipline is psychology, not history, but I think she should just hand this in for her PhD. <laughs> and I'll tell you, most students do not finish their dissertation in two years in history. But it's a tour de force, I think, of research and, and genealogical storytelling. But, you know, I think everybody sort of understands the marketing um, attractiveness of doing one in the first family, but what would you say are other reasons that this family, you know, in hindsight, why would this be a good family to follow, even if they weren't uh, in the White House? 
Well, you know, the reason I, of course, ended up doing the book was because it's Michelle Obama. She's our first African-American first lady. She's a historic figure. Um, but for me, what was most meaningful was tracing um, the stories and finding the fragments and the documentation and the records scattered um, all over the country about these ancestors who are people no one knows, they're not famous people, they were very ordinary people um, who bit by bit moved the family forward, stumbling backwards sometimes, moving forward sometimes, and in five generations carried this family from slavery to the White House. And I actually felt, um, you know, really um, passionate about their stories. They were very ordinary people. They were farmers and sharecroppers. They were railroad porters and carpenters. They were domestics and postal clerks. Um, there was a college president in there too. <laughs> Um, but they were people, white, black, and in between, who are people we could recognize in our own families. And I think it was the power of their story that really drew me in. And, and you know, in reading it, and actually right in the beginning, as you start to unpack these lives and these stories, I almost started to feel like this is not just Michelle Obama's story, it's many family stories. I started to recognize elements of my family in there, and, and I think that that's what's so amazing about this country and what your book is so uh, fantastic at sort of revealing to us both the, the strengths, the successes, and the struggles. Do you want to read a little bit of, because I, I found most fascinating to look at families, and I think everyone's family has people who are successful, moderately successful, and then at the same time people who are really struggling to hold it together and people who don't hold it together and right. aren't successful at all. And, and that's what's sort of gripping in yeah. these stories. These were, um, I'll read a little bit, but I, I can't um, but agree more with what you said. It's, it's really fascinating to look at the paths that people took and the enormous, enormous difficulty that people faced. I think, um, you know, in the 21st century, we think about slavery and reconstruction and the rise of segregation and and you know it's history it's you know it's past but when you have faces and individuals stories and you read you know the contemporaneous history of the time of people who are living through this um, it's enormous you know the first lady's family lived through slavery emancipation um, the Civil War, which came before emancipation, Reconstruction, the hopes of Reconstruction, and watched those hopes, you know, um, uh, die away with uh, the end of Reconstruction and the rise of segregation. You can see them living in, um, in mixed communities before uh, segregation took root and watched them be scattered and forced into all black communities. And, um, you know, I asked the first lady's aunt about how people managed, how she imagined her ancestors, her, her parents, her grandparents managed, and what was their American dream at a time when everything seemed so stacked against them. And she said um, their American dream was to dream a little at a time. And that really struck with me. You know, these were people who, in the midst of everything, um, still try to keep going, and some people made it, but some people didn't. I'm gonna read, um, there are two parts that I would like to read. I'll just read because this speaks a little bit to um, the story of uh, the First Lady's great, great, great grandmother, Melvinia, who um, after slavery uh, ended up moving a bit north. And as I mentioned, she had a biracial son, and part of what I was hoping to do was to identify the white father of the son, this, these white ancestors that Mrs. Obama long suspected that she had. So this is a little bit from um, Melvinia's story uh, after slavery. Nearly a decade would pass before she gathered up her children and headed north on her own. Black people walked then, sometimes for miles and miles on those dusty country roads, 
or squeezed onto the crowded, rattling railroad cars that chug between small towns in rural upcountry Georgia. Sometime in the 1870s, Melvinia put some 60 miles between herself and her past. And somewhere along the way, she decided to keep the truth about her son's heritage to herself. People who knew her said she never talked about her time in slavery or about the white man who so profoundly shaped her formative years as a teenager and a young mother. She never discussed who he was or what happened between them, whether she was a victim of his brutality or a mistress he treated affectionately, or whether she was loved and was loved in return. She went her way and he went his, and just like that, their family split right down the middle. Their children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren, some black, some white, and some in between, scattered across the country as the decades passed, separated by the color line and the family's fierce determination to step beyond its painful roots in slavery. Contemporary America emerged from that multiracial stew, a nation peopled by the heirs of that agonizing time who struggled and strived with precious little knowledge of, the, of their own origins. Melvinia's descendants would soar to unprecedented heights, climbing from slavery to the pinnacle of American power in five generations. Her great, great, great granddaughter, Michelle Obama, would become the nation's first African American first lady. Yet Mrs. Obama would take that momentous step without knowing Melvinia's name or the identity of the white man who was her great, great, great grandfather. For more than a century, Melvinia's secret held. Powerful, you know, and what so many people, and what Mrs. Obama found, as so many people do, is that their families weren't talking about these mixed roots, that the the stigma of slavery and the the oppression of the post Reconstruction or the Reconstruction and what happened afterwards in many states. I mean, we always think about it as in the South. What I what I loved about the book was, it's a story that we know, but yet having these human faces to it, having these family stories attached to it made it seem so much more real and personal and fresh. And I think so many families haven't talked about where they came from, how they happen to have so many different colors in their family. Um, it's just something that people didn't discuss. That's right. And really, on both sides of Mrs. Obama's family, you know, the the white distance cousins that she has and her, uh, the black members of her family, over and over, people said the same thing. Her uncle talked about you know, trying to ask the older people in his family. They were from South Carolina, Georgetown, South Carolina, um, where you know, there were these vast rice plantations. Um, didn't people have any stories from that? You know, he still had family, there's still family that lives there. And didn't anyone have any, weren't there any family stories about all the different shades um, of color in the family? And he said over and over again, no one had an answer, no one wanted to talk about it. Um, I was lucky enough to find two people who knew Melvinia, which is astonishing when you consider that she was born in 1844. But she lived a long time, and these people lived a long time. Uh, one was a woman who married her grandson and lived with her in the 1930s. Melvinia, at the end of her life, um, middle to end of her life, it was, became a midwife. And one of the people she brought into the world was a man who ended up being in her neighbor. And he also shared his story. Uh, both of those people have since died. But they told me that they remembered Melvinia, a dark-skinned woman with these children, these two sons that they knew, who were very fair, near white, as they described them, and no husband, no father in evidence, and no one talked about it. And, you know, among the white descendants um, of the slave owner who owned Melvinia, uh, people also told me that they, hadn't, they didn't know anything about the slave owning history in their family. Many of them did not. Uh, these, this family that owned uh, Melvinia, were, they were Irish Americans and, um, you know, the Shields family. And their descendants said, you know, this was a struggling family. You know, we, we didn't know anything about, this was not a wealthy family. How, how could it be that they owned slaves? 
And so some of them had no idea it had been lost over time. In other cases, it had been obscured deliberately. And one woman said, you know, she went to her elderly mother and said, Mom, you know, uh, they're saying this thing about slavery in our family and slave ownership. It can't be true. And her mother said it was true. And she had raised her children uh, without that information. I think that, you know, I. It's sort of, we're getting to, I think, isn't there recently um, an anniversary of the miniseries Roots and what a profound impact that program had on um, the racial consciousness of the time when it came out, which was like 80s, I think. Mm -hmm. Do, what kind of reaction, I mean, I can see this, I've already said to Rachel, this should be a miniseries. But <laughs> <laughs> Any filmmakers out there? <laughs> But, but I really, you know, what kind of reactions have you been getting as people hear these stories and hear this about all of a sudden uh, an Irish family finding out that they have a, a whole set of um, African American cousins or vice versa? What kind mm -hmm. of reactions have you had from the different constituent groups? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, as I mentioned, um, in terms of Mrs. Obama's family, these, these Irish-American um, distant cousins of hers, which are scattered across the country, um, had varied reactions. Some of them wanted nothing to do with the research, nothing to do with me. Um, there was um, a sense that um, perhaps, I think a concern that they would be vilified as racists or that they would be asked to atone publicly for things that their ancestors had done. There were others who were curious, didn't want to be in the book, certainly not by name, but were curious and, and wanted to know more. And, um, and so they shared their records with me um, and their family stories. And then there were some that really grappled with the history openly and, and, you know, and basically said, you know, it's, it's not, um, my history, it's not, it's not a history I would have chosen, but it is my history. And, you know, some of these conversations were not easy ones because, you know, I'm a reporter from the New York Times and we often think of ourselves as having a distance um, and try to keep a distance from um, the stories that we're covering. But this was um, a situation in where who I was um, in the eyes of many of these descendants couldn't be separated from the work I was doing. And so when they saw me, they saw, yes, a woman from the, Af uh, from the New York Times, but they also saw an African-American woman. And, you know, one uh, woman said to me, quite frankly, that that was a concern she had. Could, could I be fair to her people? Would I treat them fairly? And, um, you know, some of these conversations um, are not easy. And I, I said to her, well, you know, Mrs. Obama has said that she recognizes that this is part of her history, that uh, the blood of slaves and slave owners runs through her veins and that she accepts that. That's part of who she is. And this woman said, yes, but we are on the wrong side of that history. And it was, you know, these were, you know, um, not easy conversations and even you know and it was interesting for me too as a journalist thinking about how you know my presence might make someone more or less willing to talk about it in the end I think people uh, were ultimately persuaded that I could be fair but it was you know it was interesting so, so talking in fairness, about it so 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 the African-American relatives they, then it was more of an advantage. Yeah, it was. <laughs> then they thought, well, I understood. <laughs> so it, it, it yeah. had two sides. It, it had, had two, two sides. sides to it. Yep. You know, I think um, doing this kind of research is, is so fascinating, so difficult. Um, I mean, besides just persistence, you know, hanging out the side of their door, um, were there any, like, unique strategies to sort of get people to open up, have, a, you know, a couple drinks? <laughs> You know, I, I ha as a journalist, you know, this was an enormous luxury because we, you know, sometimes, you know, early in my career, I'd write two or three stories a day. Um, and actually, these days, in the era of the internet and the web, sometimes we still do. Um, so to have the opportunity to do such a deep dive into history and to have the time to write was an enormous um, privilege. It also helped. Um, the time helped. So. 
uh, for some people who were concerned and anxious, um, you know, having the time, um, having months, a period of months to, to go back, you know, one woman, uh, one of the white descendants, um, we talked on the phone and then she agreed to meet me at a Starbucks. Then, you know, a month or so later, she said, okay, come on over. Then, a month or two later, she said, well, let me introduce you to my sister. <laughs> and so I think um, the time helped, that they saw that I was serious. I think also, too, what helped was that, um, listen, if someone comes to you and knocks on your door and says, do you know that your great-great-grandmother was doing X in 1879, it's hard to close the door. <laughs> you want to know. So sometimes people wanted to talk to me just because they were fast, you know, they thought, oh my goodness, you know, this is my family, this is amazing. And even if they were a little, you know, anxious, they really were interested in, in, in the records that I had. Well, you know, I was inspired. I loved how, you know, you, you were so true to your sources and true to the people by not, I was talking with um, people at, earlier, saying by not making up conversations, but really sticking to the facts, but yet being able to mine them for so much more. Like, I, I know I had looked way back at the, um, some census data and seen where my grandfather lived, but I never thought of looking at who else lived in the neighborhood and what jobs they had and being able to extrapolate from that more about the community, which you did so beautifully over and over. And you know, with, with research like this, it's, it's really difficult. You, uh, would I, um, particularly doing research on African Americans, so um, African Americans, as you may or may not know, did not appear by name in the census until 1870 if they were enslaved. Um, you know, their weddings and baptisms and funerals were not covered um, by the newspapers. And, um, you know, people would say, oh, letters and journals, but of course, African Americans were barred by law from being able to read and write. And so it was very difficult. And so often what I would do is, you know, like you mentioned, if you have one record, like a census record, it tells you a little something about them. but what else is on that record tells you a little more about the community mm -hmm. that they lived in. And I also try to get contemporaneous accounts of places and times when there simply were no records or no voices of family that could guide me. So Melvinia, after um, the war, after emancipation in Clayton County, Georgia, here she is a free woman um, and you want to know, well, what was it like? Well, there's no one alive who could tell me, but I spent time in the National Archives looking through the Freedmen's Bureau records, which told me about, you know, the hunger in the land and the number of families on rations and the people moving from place to place desperately trying to find their loved ones. But there were times, frankly, where I simply couldn't find anything. And in those instances, as you said, I didn't try to hide it. In some ways, I, I tried to make um, the absence part of the story, because it is part of the story, right? The absence of African Americans from history at these critical moments is a part of our story, because, in fact, we weren't allowed to kind of participate fully in a way that would allow our stories to be documented. And also, the fact that people didn't share their stories was part of the story. And I'll tell you, I'll just read another little part about, um, that gives you a sense of that. Um, let's see. You know, I said something like, you know, Phoebe, who was the First Lady's great-grandmother, and you end up having your favorites among these long-lost dead people, and this is one of, she's one of mine. Phoebe would never tell her children why she settled here or there. She would not talk about the heartbreak of leaving family and friends and old graves behind or about the heady exhilaration of stepping out of one life and into a new one. Between her 19th and 22nd birthdays, Phoebe trekked through several cities in southern Illinois, but her footprints are not easy to find. County officials captured her stop in Carbondale, where they recorded her short-lived marriage in 1899. Census enumerators found her a year later when she was a widow living with her in-laws back home in Villa Ridge. She told her children later in life only bits and pieces about the detour she made along the way. 
More than a century has passed since Phoebe left Villa Ridge for the second time, and it often seems as if her footsteps were covered in dust by the relentless winds that blow across the plains. In some places, the road she traveled was inadvertently swept clean by the passing years and the thousands of migrants who came after her. In other places, it seems, she stopped, turned, and deliberately obscured her own trail. So, you know, there are gaps in her stories, countless unknowns. There are tales that her children have forgotten and tales that she chose not to share. And part of that, I didn't, you know, a part of that is, is those holes are part of our story, you know. I have one question that someone wrote in. I wanted to read it. It's kind of interesting. It says, um, the concept of shame seems to be on both sides of the slavery story. Mrs. Obama's white cousins were ashamed to learn that they owned her ancestors, and black people are ashamed of our enslavement, so we keep the secret. Do we see that changing because of books like this? Are people other than scholars and journalists talking more, op more openly about enslavement? What do you think? They ask me about it at universities, I hope so, but. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think not enough. But I think that, you know, people are, um, they're, you know, with the advance of, you know, DNA testing and all of these online genealogical tools, Ancestry.com and FamilySearch.org, people are making these discoveries themselves, you know, at their dinner tables at night and making these connections with uh, relatives, um, long lost folks across the color line. And, um, and some people are reaching out and trying to, you know, make those kinds of connections. I think it's, it's still not easy. Um, and there have been some people who have come to some of my talks, uh, some uh, white readers who have come and told me about their efforts. You know, I found out that I have slave owners in my family and I am now trying to find um, the descendants of uh, some of the slaves we owned. And in fact, someone even mentioned to me a website feel like it was coming to the table or something like that where uh, for the descendants of slaves and slave owners. So I think in, in, in small ways, you know, people are doing this. I think I sort of feel strongly that we should be having more and more of these conversations even though they are difficult ones. I, I think we don't do it enough. I, th I think it is difficult for people to, to admit this, to think about having been slaves, for some people, I know that I've talked, whom I've talked to, they seem to feel that it's a victimization again to talk about it, and so they don't. They think that by not talking about it, it's better. Um, it's it's really a very complicated conversation for everyone. I think that's true, and and for African American families, I think that is true. There's this sense, I think, of slavery being something that we wanted to get through and past and that by you know, raising children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren free of that time, free of that history, that we were sending them off um, into the world unburdened by that, giving them more opportunity because they were not burdened by that story. And I can understand that, and I think those ans of our ancestors must have thought that they were giving us a gift by doing that, but I think there was a lot lost in that. Well, you know, you're, there's actually not that much about slavery in your book, and it moves beyond that, which mm -hmm. to me is a really um, important part of, of your research because so many people trace back, and it is traced back, uh, a lot of our issues around race and color to slavery, but we don't always talk about what happened afterwards you know, it's not as though there's the Emancipation Proclamation, everybody was happy and went off <laughs> to read and vote and, yeah, right, and right. live their lives. But in fact, and, and this is the part that I think you really put a, a personal or a human face and the family story to, where people founded banks, founded businesses, and then were squashed back down, started learning to read, become educated, and were crushed again. And, you know, there are some people, as you pointed out, in this family and as many families who are able to keep surmounting those obstacles, but other people, when they're crushed, they stay crushed. And, and that was kind of the story that I think we don't talk about. What happened, not just at slavery, but why are there still these repercussions that we feel maybe in some of the, the youth 
and some of the families who are still struggling today, this, those feelings of total um, abandonment, total um, disconnection, disconnectedness from the rest of society that really had their roots not just in slavery but in the decades that followed where those laws right. were just um, like South Africa. Right. right. I mean, Mrs. Obama's family really had front row seats to this process of, you know, emancipation, um, the hopes that came with that, the difficulties too, because the, the economically a lot of, there's a lot of hardship at that time, which is not something that we often think about when we think of that moment and that time of freedom. Um, but they really witnessed this closing of the door of opportunity. Um, they lived in places where, for a time, African Americans had the right to vote, um, where African Americans elected um, black leaders to public office. They lived through a time that, uh, where there was a great deal of hope. And they also lived during a time where literally those doors closed right before their eyes. So the First Lady's um, great-great-grandfather, Dolphus Shields, watched that story happen, as did many of them, and those in South Carolina too, where as Reconstruction was coming to end, coming to an end, you had, you know, people riding through the South, you know, people were beaten, um, people were disenfranchised um, through, you know, the law, the laws were changed, you know, state by state, you can see the same poll taxes, literacy, testing, um, but also the violence, the enormous yeah. amount of violence You know, that there the Ku Klux Klan in Michigan. So, you know, we always think it's all in the South, but there are chapters of the Ku Klux Klan in Michigan, in Illinois, today. Yeah. It's, and, you know, people don't hear about it or don't talk about it. Yeah, and during this time, it was a real, um, the Klan and vigilantism and violence, lynchings. You know, Phoebe, the First Lady's great grandmother lived in Chicago during the riots in 1919. And her family tells a story. She had many, many children. I, I'm not sure, maybe she had nine at the time. Her husband was a Pullman porter and an itinerant minister and was not home then. And they, her, um, one of her surviving sons, who is also dead now, told me that his mother put a pot on the stove with water and lye and boiled it because people, white people were pulling black people out of cars, out of buses, people were dying and she was ready if someone was gonna come up her steps. <laughs> um, and then, you know, the stories of, you know, the people who made it and the people who didn't, you know. Dolphus Shields, the First Lady's great-great-grandfather, was a force of nature. Um, in many ways, not the most likable man, but he was a man who, some, as a sharecropper, he was born into slavery and saw the sharecropping life afterwards and decided that that was not for him. And by 1900 in Birmingham, he owned his own home. By 1910, he was a, a business owner. He ended up founding, becoming a founding member of two churches in Birmingham that still live today are still up and running today. And when he died, the news of his passing uh, was on the front page of the black newspaper at the time. He really pulled the family from that sharecropping life, that line of it, into uh, the working class, into the black middle class to some degree. But he left Georgia. Well, he had a brother who stayed. And that was the brother who stayed with Melvinia, who you know, stayed in, in, um, in, they ended up in Cartersville and then Kingston, Georgia, um, who struggled. A wife left him, um, another one died. Um, he pooled all the money that he had to buy a house for the family. Um, but you know, his big brother was the one who was the one that everyone was excited about, the one who had made it. And you know, I remember the day that I saw Henry, who was younger, died before Dolphus did, and, and the two brothers feuded. Um, but I, I got a hold of his death certificate, and he had such, I loved Henry, because Henry was, Henry was the one who, who tried and just didn't make it. And his death certificate, um, it said he died of cirrhosis. And in parentheses, the doctor put possible alcoholism. And you know, 
that was just the story for some people. Did you want to show some slides? Do yep. you have slides? I do. Because talking about these people, it's, I wanted more pictures. I, <laughs> I wish I had more pictures. Um, this is the first first family. This is Michelle Obama's first family. She looks like her mom. <laughs> she does. does this is Michelle Obama as a baby with her mother and her father and her brother, who is a basketball coach now. This is uh, Joan Tribble, one of the descendants of Melvinia's um, white slave owner, who was one of the people um, who grappled openly with this history. This is Jewel Barclay, who is a great-granddaughter of Dolphus Shields, who also shared uh, her memories and her photos and her DNA. I mentioned uh, that Dolphus was quite uh, a figure in Birmingham um, from the 1880s to 1950 when, his, when he died. It was his children and grandchildren that ended up moving north, and his daughter, Pearl, ended up moving to Cleveland, Ohio. And that is Dolphus Shields, um, the man to your left, who was the great great grandmother, great great grandfather of Mrs. Obama, who was biracial, and his son Willie. This is Dolphus as an older man, and Dolphus uh, with his extended family in front of his house in Birmingham. For a long time, I didn't have photos of the Irish American Shields family from that time. So this is a tombstone of the man who owned Melvinia. His name was Henry Wells Shields. And this is a tombstone of Henry's son, who also lived in um, Clayton County and Henry County, Georgia. This is the First Lady's aunt, um, who is holding some photos of some ancestors that I'm going to show you. I'm going to skip around a little bit here, if I can. Uh, this is Phoebe, uh, the First Lady's great-grandmother, the one who had the lye boiling on the stove. Um, she was um, born in 1879, a sharecropper's daughter who decided she wanted nothing to do with that kind of life, and was among the first of the First Lady's family to see the skyscrapers of Chicago in 1908. And this is her husband, who wasn't there during the riots. He was a Pullman porter, uh, itinerant minister, and um, a stern man, so they say. This is the First Lady's great-great-grandmother. This is Phoebe's mother. And uh, the story goes that she was part Cherokee. And if you um, look at her, it's, it would seem that that would make sense to you looking at her photograph. Um, but I, I was never able to determine uh, conclusively whether that was true. I'm going to flip back a little bit. This is the First Lady's grandfather, Fraser Robinson, and, and we talked about those people who made it and those people who really struggled. He was one who really struggled. He was born in Georgetown, South Carolina, and he was the golden boy of his generation. You know, he was um, a stellar student. Um, he was on the, an orator, he was on the debating team, um, he, was, uh, he could fix anything electrical. He, he always dreamed about being an electrical engineer and he decided um, in, 19, in the 1930s, as many people uh, did, that uh, the South was not for him and so he moved to Chicago but arrived there in 1931 right in the midst of the Depression and his dreams never materialized the way that he had hoped they would. This photo, I told you that it, for a while I didn't have any um, photos of uh, the family that owned um, Mrs. Obama's ancestors, but after the book was published and after a, an article that was adapted from the book appeared in the New York Times, I got an email from a woman who said, oh my goodness, those Shields people, I think those are my husband's people, and I think we have a photo of them, and I was like, oh my gosh. Um, but in fact, um, it turned out to be true. And um, she and her husband handed uh, me the first photo of uh, the Shields family. It looks like two slaves are standing in the back. Well, this is, she's got a good eye. And some people don't know that, and I'll, I'll tell you about that um, in a bit. This is after slavery. She's talking about, um, if you look carefully, the two guys, the, the well-dressed man and the woman next to him who were st standing there behind them, you can see wearing hats. Um, two black men it looks like. Um, but I'll tell you a little bit about them. 
Um, so if you look here, um, this, the older gentleman with the beard is Henry Wells Shields, who um, by uh, something of an accident of history ended up inheriting three human beings, uh, including Melvinia, the first lady's great, great, great grandmother. And this is his wife. The reason why he ended up owning slaves was he married the daughter of a wealthy man. And when her father died, he inherited uh, those slaves. And this, the well-dressed man here is the man who we believe that DNA testing suggests was most likely the father of Dolphus Shields. Now this, this photo um, is after slavery. I think it's around 1884. I, I don't remember the date now. But the two black men who are here, um, I also was like, goodness, who are they? And actually, the family knows exactly who they were. The, the, the thing that's interesting about this photo is that they have the names of everybody in that photo, including the names of those people, though at the time they only used first initials. Mm -hmm. um, and so they are not um, relatives of the First Lady. But in fact, and so I don't know much about them, but I did recognize their names of, um, from the names from census um, records, from earlier census records of white families who had lived mm -hmm. alongside the Shields family. So I suspect that they may have been people who were owned by those families or the children of people who were owned by those families. So it was really a remarkable thing when I got a hold of this photo. I was like, oh wow, that's something else. And then the last photo that I'll show you is um, a week after the book was published, the city uh, of Rex, which is in Clayton County, Georgia, um, unveiled uh, a monument in honor of Melvinia, who was enslaved there. And they had gotten started after reading that article I wrote in the New York Times in October of 2009. And as it would happen, they were done around the same time I was done with <laughs> the book. And so they invited um, Melvinia's descendants to come. And at the very last minute, I asked whether some of the White Shields um, descendants wanted to come too, and they did. Some came from Georgia. Some came from Alabama. Um, the families met for the first time, and um, they shared stories and photographs and phone numbers and had a meal together. I'm not sure that they're going to be hanging out for decades to come. Um, but it was really something to see. You know, we could keep talking, but I know that some people in the audience will want to ask a question or two. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, first, I'd like to say that I think you did a very uh, nice and balanced job in describing the nature of the relationship between uh, an enslaved woman and a slave owner or a white non-slave person with whom she had a relationship. And I was wondering whether, as a consequence of that, you think some of the members of the Shields family and their descendants would be more inclined to share uh, information with you given the fact that they now have a uh, better understanding of our receptivity and our need for this information and the fact that we don't have our own documented history. I don't know that um I have not seen a change um, in the folks who were unwilling to participate. Um, I haven't seen any more willingness on their part. Uh, that people, the folks who were in that middle group who were sharing but not willing to come public, um, one of those was the woman who said, I, I don't know if you could be fair with my people. And she thanked me and said she appreciated it. She thought that I was fair. Was it what she, it wasn't the story she was, dying to read, but she thought that it was fair. Um, this whole question, though, of, of records and um, of sharing records is, is a good question because, of course, um, as I mentioned, for African Americans who are enslaved, we don't appear in the census. It's where we appear, if we appear, are often in wills. Sometimes people have these records of slave ownership still in their family and, and, and you know, uh, farm records or documents. Um, I've come across, as I mentioned, uh, white families who say, you know, I have these records. I wish there was a way for me to connect and to, you know, I have names of people, you know, I, I wish I could do that. Um, and, um, you know, it is it's something, it's, it's a bit unsettling, to be frank, sometimes when you look you know, Melvinia first appears in the public record in, um, in a will and then in estate records. And 
you know, it's an inventory of her um, owner's farm. So there are the spinning wheels and the calico curtains and the horses and the cows and the human beings. And it's something when you read a record like that. Um, but that's where people who were enslaved, if, you're, if you can find anything at all, um, that's what you'll find. And some, some white families still do have those records. I just wondered, um, is Mrs. Obama aware of your work? Um, did you have conversations with her? And the other question I had was, um, how, how did you support yourself during the, the research? Oh, <laughs> such good questions. <laughs> so uh, yes, Mrs. Obama was aware of my work. I had covered her during her time in the White House that first year, and um, you know she was aware of the story, in fact. Reporters asked the president's press secretary in the briefing room about the, the story, and uh, they told us that she was fascinated by it. And I briefed her staff along the way as I was doing uh, the research. The, the sad thing for those of us who are writing books about Michelle Obama is that she has a strict policy. She doesn't do any book interviews at all. She is going to write her own book about her time in the White House after she leaves it. And um, you know, it's my understanding that she's been advised to preserve her voice for her own book. So I have not spoken to Mrs. Obama, and I'm very sorry about that. Um, but you know, members of her family share their stories and their memories with me. I did get books to her and um, to her staff and to her family ahead of time, with the thinking that um, if there's going to be a book about your family, you probably want to read it before it's on the shelf in Barnes and Noble. Um, and I do know that her family finds it fascinating, so I hope that she does too. On the support question, this is not a small matter. So um, I, uh, a book leave at the New York Times means actually quitting your job at the New York Times. And so, um, you know, with a letter saying, you know, we'll welcome you back. So I really had to pull together a variety of resources. No advance? Some advance. <laughs> an advance, of course, which is wonderful and helpful. Um, but I have two children and a mortgage. <laughs> and also, this was, uh, you know, for my editor, who is wonderful, this was something of a leap of faith. I mean, uh, I did not have, you know, some, you know, 40-page proposal. I basically had a letter saying, I think there's something really interesting here, don't you? <laughs> and so, really, we didn't know what storylines we would find or what this was going to look like. So I had to travel around the country. The expenses were considerable. So in addition to the advance, I... Um, found fellowships, you know, there are think tanks in Washington that support uh, journalists who uh, write books. The Wilson Center um, in Washington is one of them. Um, other uh, institutions supported me in other ways. My husband, who was enormously supportive of my work, wanted desperately to get me out of the house because <laughs> he was afraid of my horizontal filing and of all of this paper that I was going to collect. And he said, surely someone wants a writer in residence. <laughs> And so um, Catholic University, for instance, provided me with office space. The Smithsonian's African American History and Culture Muse Museum, which is going to be out on the mall with a building someday, also provided me with, with space. I took longer than I thought I would, and so I had to scramble at the very last minute. And uh, the Fletcher Foundation um, helped me through with uh, a fellowship that kept me going for the last six months. So it really was a combination of things. But I have to interject, things. you know, two years to write this kind of, to do this kind of research in academia's warp speed and um, no graduate assistant. Well, I had some, the Wilson Center provided oh, okay. me with a, a part-time uh, person while I was there and, um, and Catholic University also a part-time person. So these were young people who um, helped um, in, in bits and pieces, though as I, we were discussing earlier, I, I'm not an academic, and so some of the things, some of the basics that academics know in terms of, you know, I've got all these records and a bibliography. Um, if I had 
I, I should have um, directed um, to the librarian, <laughs> or, so, or received some sort of assistance on that side of things. Which, or, or I, I would do that a little differently. I'm just in <laughs> awe that you've kept all these names straight. I had to constantly <laughs> look at the. Uh, my husband said, "Too many. Don't talk to me about these people." <laughs> oh my gosh! Yeah, I, I'm name challenged. There are anyway. family trees in there to help yes, you. <laughs> it does help. It does help. An another question is here. John Rose. I. I have not read the book, and they were all out. So I'm curious as to whether the book reflects on Michelle Obama's African roots as opposed to her American roots. And the answer to that is, is it's a very good question. The answer is no. I don't know. I could not trace the farthest back on her mother's side that I could trace was Melvinia, who was born in 1844. And on her father's side were to ancestors who were born maybe the earliest, like maybe the 1830s. Actually, I take that back. She had free ancestors, um, ancestors who were free before the Civil War, who I could trace back, who were born around 1800. But none of them could I take that far back. And even the DNA testing, you know, is so general. It says kind of West Africa, but not, not anything specific. Anyone else? I don't see anyone. Well, I, I just really recommend the book to you, John, and other people. That it's really um, fascinating, exciting. It's kind of a mystery story because, of course, she's already told us now who the suspected father is, but you keep reading. I, keep, I kept wondering, well, who is it? Who is it? I, 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 of course, always guess wrong. But um, I just want to say thank you so much for sharing with us. and. I just look forward to the miniseries. And actually, the one thing I should say before I go, which I often want to tell people, is that uh, I ended up feeling like I wanted to be a preacher of the gospel of genealogy. And this book got written because it was about Michelle Obama's ancestors. But we all have these stories in our family tree. We all have these stories of ancestors who lived extraordinary lives, ordinary and extraordinary. And, um, you know, sometimes we wait too long. And I would say right now, if there's one thing you take away from this experience, in addition to the book, is, is to go home and talk to the older people in your families. And to look at those old photographs that you have, to get names attached to them, to, to gather up those old records. Um, you know, we um, often write about our presidents and first ladies, but we here are the people who built this country and our ancestors are those people. And so don't forget them until it's too late. Gather their stories, if not for yourself, uh, for your children and grandchildren. It oh, looks like- One more, Diane. I was just thinking, if you have a few more minutes and we're still a few minutes, could you read a little more from the book, one of your about Melvinia. <laughs> what time is it? Yeah, and I think we, uh, we're good. Um, we have about, it's about five or seven. Okay, wonderful. <laughs> One of the things that really interested me was, um, you know, we know about, um, we know about um, segregation, we know about uh, reconstruction, um, but you know, and I knew about these things in the most general ways. But in slavery, I, I realized it was such a varied experience. And um, I was fascinated by, you know, I mentioned that these folks knew, um, these descendants said, but these white shields, what, what do you mean they own slaves? And, you know, we have this notion of, you know, what slavery was, this, these vast plantations, and it really was quite varied. And Melvinia's experience was quite different from the experience that we often uh, think about. And so I'll read you a little section about that. This is, um, I mentioned that Melvinia's owner um, died, and that's how she ended up um, uh, being inherited by this family. She was a little girl, about eight years old, when her owner died in Spartanburg, South Carolina. And she was shipped as a little girl far from anyone she knew uh, to this place in Georgia. And this section is about that journey and also about what slaveholding was like. The Southern Plantation is a fixture of the American imagination. Close your eyes and you can almost see it. The grand white manor with its ornate columns 
the sweeping expanse of green clover, the stately magnolias filling the warm spring breezes with their sweet perfume. Some conjure up visions of Thomas Jefferson's Monticello, his 5,000 acre mountain estate in Virginia, with its 43 rooms, eight fireplaces, and 200 slaves. Others invoke Scarlett O'Hara's mythical mansion in Gone with the Wind, which bustled with the clink of fine china and silver and the comings and goings of the housemaids and more than a hundred enslaved laborers. That fabled mansion stood near Jonesboro, Georgia, only about five miles from the farm where Melvinia ended up sometime around 1852. But Melvinia's new home, situated in Georgia's rough upcountry, was nothing like those vast plantations that often come to mind. She never knew that kind of life. When Melvinia arrived in 1852, she stepped into a place of dirt roads and neglected bridges, a community of plain and unassuming people, according to observers, who raised their families in log cabins or rough-hewn cottages. The fields were filled with white men, many of them illiterate or nearly so, who handled the backbreaking labor of planting, plowing, and harvesting corn, wheat, and cotton on their own. It was the kind of place that many wealthy Southerners dismissed as backward and provincial. Archibald T. Burke, a slave owner who settled in the region around the same time that Melvinia did, worried that his wealthy fiance would be unhappy with his choice of a new home. I am sometimes fearful that you will not be pleased with the society in the upcountry he wrote his bride to be. You will think it strange to see white people living in log cabins, and you will find all sorts of society here except aristocracy. It is unlikely that anyone asked Melvinia her thoughts on the matter, but the little girl might have been startled too when she laid eyes on her new home and her new master, Henry Wells Shields. He was a man in his prime, a property owner in his mid-thirties and the married patriarch of a growing clan that already included eight children. Yet he, like the other white yeoman farmers in the county, worked the land with his own hands. He had never owned a slave in his life. There is no record of this first encounter between Melvinia and Henry, between the dark-eyed slave girl and her new white master. There is no way to know whether Henry felt at a loss at that moment, uncertain of his bearings as he looked at this young child suddenly thrust into his care, or whether he had been eagerly waiting, praying for this day to come. Born in South Carolina, Henry had been trying for at least four years to carve out a future for himself in the rocky, middling soil in upcountry Georgia. Melvinia's arrival and that of her enslaved companions, Tom and Mandrew, completely transformed his prospects. He was now, suddenly, a member of the county elite, the tiny privileged class of men who owned human property. As for Melvinia, she was forced to adjust to a completely new existence. She had been a little girl nurtured in a bustling community of African Americans, now should be one of only three black slaves in a sea of white faces. Once the favorite slave of a wealthy family, she was now the prized possession of a farmer still struggling to make a name for himself. No matter how much or how little she knew about Henry that day she stood before him in Georgia, she certainly understood that her fate and her future and her very survival rested in the, man, in the hands of a man who was still learning how to be a master.